informing evidence from research and practice across Europe. So my presentation, I'm going to be briefly talk about what is bovine. I'm going to talk about why did we set up bovine? How did it work? And then what are we going to talk about today? So in terms of what bovine is, bovine was a three-year project that was uh, funded by the European Commission to establish a network to address sustainability challenges faced by the European beef sector. It involved 18 partners across nine member states, and we were funded for 2 million. But our core objective was to address the 385,000 beef farmers across Europe. And um, so even though there were all member states were not represented in the consortium, this project is very much for all European beef farmers. So why was it set up? Well, any of you who are involved in the beef sector will be well aware that research, industry, citizens, uh, policymakers, everyone is saying beef farming must become more sustainable. So from a farmer perspective, they will say, OK, no problem. We are happy to become more sustainable. But really, what does that mean for us? You know, what are we supposed to do? And that's where bovine came in. It switched the narrative around. It said, OK, farmers, what do you need? We will go and find solutions for you. So instead of a top down approach, you need to become more sustainable. You need to become more sustainable. We asked farmers, what do you need? And we went out and found solutions to, for those needs. So how did we do it? So um, having identified. Got that process from one of our presenters. Switch microphones, I think. Maybe thanks, Richard. Okay, I'll use this microphone. Um, so, having identified farmers' needs, we then went on to uh, put put that those needs through the bovine process to identify solutions from two different sources of knowledge. We identified there's a lot of research already been done. So, we asked research, what what um, have you looked at this issue, and what research have you done? What solutions have you come up with? And then we talked to farmers as well, because we are very well aware that farmers are very good sources of knowledge and that they can come up with a lot of solutions to their own um, challenges as well. And that solutions in one part of Europe may well be translatable to other contexts as well. And it's just about sharing that knowledge. So that was what, what we did. We set up a framework to uh, collect those needs that were uh, founded on the different elements of sustainability. So we had socioeconomic resilience, animal health and welfare, production efficiency and meat quality, and environmental sustainability. And we have gathered all of those needs in a needs register. So that's a very important resource that will be useful for policymakers, researchers, and others into the future. So the bovine networks, um, as I mentioned, we wanted to talk to farmers to identify their, their needs. So we established networks um, to identify their needs, but also to identify the solutions across the member states that were represented within the consortium. And we had a dedicated network manager. You may recognize some of those faces from the um, events that you participated in over the last three years. But each of those dedicated network managers was responsible for establishing the network and making sure the knowledge flowed within that network. Overlaid across that, then we had thematic working groups across the four key areas, and they, they were led by researchers who were able to um, bring groups of um, people, experts together within their group to identify solutions that already had been um, progressed through, through the research. And the idea was to blend and merge and integrate and cross fertilize all those different sources of knowledge through the overall bovine network. So what did we do? We actually produced solutions to 32 farmers needs. Um, and then we, uh, they are documented in the form of practice abstracts, um, and you can see those illustrated here. You'll hear a little bit more about those later on. We also were very conscious of the need to develop a lot of audiovisual content. So we produced webinars, animations, multiple videos, and um, all of those are available on the Bovine YouTube channel and various other multi-language um, um, articles and uh, all of the um, social media press releases and all of those as well. So they're all available on the Bovine website. And again, you'll hear a little bit more detail about those later on. So finally, just to confirm the agenda for today, um, the first presentation with Maite um, from Spain and Richard from Ireland will be focusing on how did we identify, what does sustainability mean from a beef farmer's perspective and how did we identify those needs? Then we'll have presentations from our thematic working group leaders that reflect the, the four thematic areas that we spoke about. And then we'll, we'll be able to signpost you to the various resources that are available within Bovine um, for you to, to carry on into the future. And we'll have a short break between 11 and 11.15. So I hope you enjoy the day and that you find it very useful. Thank you.
Thank you, Miss. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Maita Pilar from Internet Spain. I don't know if you, uh, it's okay. Yes? <clears throat> ah, the microphone. No? So uh, I hope you can hear me okay. <laughs> so um, within the next 20 minutes, we are going to uh, show you how the Bovine Project uh, has identified big farmers' needs. Uh, as basis for finding solutions. So uh, firstly, we will see the methodology implemented to identify those farmers' needs. And afterwards, Richard from Chagas will show you this methodology in practice. So transitions to more sustainable ways of production requires of innovative and practical solutions at farm scale with an holistic view of the farming system under the socioeconomic environment. So that's quite challenging and requires the collaboration of all the actors involved. A multi-actor approach places the farmer at the center and asking them what are your needs. That is what we call in the project the grassroots needs. So this farmer's needs has been gathered considering the four thematic areas of sustainability of the project, socioeconomic resilience, animal health and welfare, environmental sustainability, and production efficiency and meat quality. And also has been gathered in nine regional and national networks. A regional network is a group of relevant farming actors of the big sector of a region managed by a network manager, which is an advisor. Uh, it can involve researchers, farmers, public authorities, advisors, vets. The composition can vary a lot depending on the region. So the network managers are the responsible of this grassroots needs collection. Uh, during the day-to-day -day activities, for example, during meetings with farmers, participating in discussion groups or in other events, while reading publications, but mainly these grassroots needs are gathered into the, the national multi-actor events organized by the network managers in bovine project, the regional and national meetings. So these meetings are organized once a year for regional national network, inviting farmers and farmer groups, station agents, rural professionals, producers associations, researchers, public administration, students, and other relevant experts and guest speakers. So that is, during these three years of the project, a total of 27 events were held in nine countries with 1,600 stakeholders, 60% of them were farmers. So we identified a total of 214 grassroots needs for the four thematic areas of the project. And here you can see some examples, for example, simple tools to measure animal health and welfare, initiative to improve with image, ideas for alternative feedstuff or tools to measure environmental sustainability. So each year, this government needs already identified in these regional national meetings and then prioritized from more than 18 grassroots needs for in a per thematic area to two priority topics per thematic area. And this process involves both practitioners, the network managers, and the researchers, the thematic working groups. In the project, there are four thematic working groups. Uh, they consist in uh, thematic working group leaders and other experts in these sustainability areas. So how does um, how this prioritization process uh, was done? So these grassroots needs identified in these national events were sent to the thematic working groups leader for the revision to the group then to have a duplicity. And then a survey was sent to the thematic working groups and to the network managers to narrow down the number from 18 to two eight grassroots needs per thematic area. And afterwards, uh, during the general assembly, a voting session was organized to select two grassroots needs per thematic area. Then the thematic working groups describe these grassroots needs and define them as priority topics. Uh, so from the more than 200 grassroots needs, the project finally selected 24 priority topics for the four thematic areas. And also you can see here some examples. For example, training animal workers for operators and um, farmers, economic planning tools, animal feeding and stress on meat quality or carbon sequestration. <coughs> so then within the project, a solution and searches for this priority topic for the four thematic areas of sustainability and the nine countries. Solutions can be of uh, two types, uh, research innovations, not yet tested on beef farms and good practices already implemented on beef farms. And also during the project, some of these research innovations were put into practice at farm level uh, through demonstrations. So all these priority topics, good practices and research innovations are available, available at the Bobby Mali Hub and also were shared uh, to the sector in, during the regional national meetings and during the transnational events. 
So uh, transitions to sustainable levels placed of farmers requires as adoption of economically viable, environmental beneficial, and socially positive solutions. So networking with the stakeholders, with farmers at the center, is key to stimulate the adoption and not the durability of these solutions. And despite all the peculiarities uh, that we found in each country, this sector, there's still many similarities in terms of needs and problems to find common solutions and to promote collective learning. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so Maite gave a good uh, overview there of the process by which we found good practices and research innovations for the bovine project. So um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about how that actually worked in action. So how that took place on, on the nine different regions in the bovine project. So as, as Maite has said, there was um, nine countries involved and each of those had a network manager. Um, so we'd, we'd, we'd networks in Ireland, Belgium, Germany, Poland, Estonia, Spain, uh, France uh, uh, and Italy, uh, and Portugal, obviously, as well. Um, so we had multiple networks formed, and within those networks, we looked at different actors that were uh, very important to disseminate knowledge within the beef industry. So farmers at, were first and foremost in that network. So we had uh, farmers at the core of that. They were the recipients of the knowledge, but also they were the ones that shared the knowledge uh, throughout the network itself. We also brought into uh, action vets, uh, breed societies, very important for sharing genetic information and breeding and so on. We brought in advisors because they were the ones, the key actors that would disseminate this knowledge throughout the networks. Uh, policy makers then were, were heavily involved at the end of this to try and bring this knowledge forward towards a uh, policy within their own country and at a European level. Scientists then informed policy makers. We had feed merchants and sale companies also feeding into this. So all of these were very important in the formation of the networks in the nine different countries. So all in all, we had a very good mix of stakeholders. And uh, we had four main areas in the project, which Maeve and Maita had alluded to just earlier. So we focused on in, a mix of stakeholders within areas that focused on socioeconomic resilience, those that focused on production efficiency and meat quality, uh, those that focused on environmental sustainability and those that focused on animal health and welfare. So we tried to get a good mix of those. And I, I, of course, there was within those then there was uh, certain stakeholders that had a lot of work involved in all of these four different areas. Um, so we formed multiple networks as a result of this uh, and were very extensive throughout the, the three years of the project and they grew as the, the project grew, <clears throat> as the project proceeded. So um, in terms of, I, I suppose, how it works in practice, um, the idea is that uh, the network manager themselves would, would visit farms on a regular basis and they would know exactly what farmers within those countries are thinking in terms of what their, their challenges are in becoming more sustainable on their farm. So they would speak to farmers on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, but also they would attend meetings and conferences. And as Mighty has said, we had nine different national meetings in the bovine project. A, a, sorry, nine meet, a meeting within the nine countries, three of those were held throughout the whole project. So within those meetings, we tried to source information in terms of the needs of the farmers, so the challenges which they were having on their farm. So uh, basically what we said is we asked the farmers, look at um, what would you like to do to become more sustainable? So some of them might have said, I have a problem with a specific issue on my farm related to, uh, it could be animal health and welfare or becoming more environmentally sustainable or so on. They also might say that I have a need for more information on how do I they become more sustainable. So it could be within the realm of a, how to become more production efficient or how do I improve my economic efficiency on the farm. Uh, so then within those nine national meetings, then uh, we collected, as, as Mike has says, 72 grassroot needs over the uh, each year. And they fed into what we call the needs register. So a very important document uh, where it details all of the needs of the farmers within each of those nine countries on a yearly basis in terms of their challenges in becoming more sustainable. So this is documented and will be available on the Bovine website uh, for all to view uh, at the end of the project. Uh, so just give you an example of how some of these needs that we collected in the meetings fed into the actual priority topics. So uh, in Italy, one of, the, um, one of the needs that was drawn from the meetings or the challenges was how do we abate the high costs of raw materials for feeding? 
And then in Estonia, a similar type uh, need was uh, how do you uh, produce grassland based feeding rations for cattle? So this was prioritized into a topic that kind of summarized uh, all of these. So it allowed our groups to research for solutions for these. And this priority topic was the use of alternative feedstuffs. Another example was in terms of animal health and welfare. In Ireland, there was vaccination protocols for live exports was called as a need for more of those, these type protocols. When in Italy, uh, they looked for on-farm health checks of cows prior to purchase because it's heavily involved in the import of, of livestock. So a need which we looked at and turned into a priority topic for us to research solutions for was a on-farm health check of young stock prior to sale and purchase. And that included vaccination status of these cattle. In within Belgium, then we had a, there was a need that was a, a found in terms of the effects of feeding on meat quality. And then in Germany, they looked at castration of young bulls in order to increase meat marbling. So both of these were related to meat quality a, in terms of animal feeding and, and management. So the priority topic which was developed on the back of this was a, animal feeding and stress and meat quality. Um, then in terms of Poland, they, they, some of the, the, this is one sample of a need was the certification for farms implementing production systems in which the carbon balance associated with the activity is favorable to the environment. Uh, within Spain, a similar type need was uh, the use of grasslands as an element of carbon sequestration and monitoring of this process. So when we developed this into a priority topic uh, for us, again, to look for solutions for, uh, we developed uh, one of the topics we come up with was reduction of carbon footprint on beef farms as a whole. So this uh, encompassed all of these type needs. So all in all, then we developed, as, as we have said, a, a good selection of topics each year for, the, uh, for us to review. And the way we, um, we found solutions for this is we went back to the nine networks within each of the countries. And we asked them, what are they doing within their own network that might address these on farms themselves? So what good practices might they be implementing that might address some of these needs that we've identified? We also had four technical working groups. And these technical working groups looked at research innovations that might be out there in the ether, but are not really been taken up by farmers themselves. So they had a look at research innovations that could be easily implemented. And as Maite says, what we did is we ran these through demonstration processes, some of these, to see if they're feasibly implemented on, on beef farms, if they can be implemented on beef farms. And we had a good selection of these across different regions as well, just to see if that one practice that might be easily implemented in one country could easily be put in place in another. So that's really it in terms of our process of how we found the needs, how we found priority topics, and then the two types of streams of information where we gained our, uh, our solutions for these. So the next four sessions of the afternoon of the morning time will we'll, uh, speak towards those solutions which we found when each, in each of the thematic areas. So our first speaker uh, of the morning is Kees de Roos from the Research Centre for Animal Production in Italy. And he's going to speak to you about topics related to socioeconomic resilience. And just before I give it over to Case, uh, just remember there's a Q&A box at the bottom for those that are viewing remotely. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So as Case is speaking and if you have any questions, please feel free to implement or input your questions into the Q&A box. Also, you can put them in in your own language. So if, if you feel more comfortable uh, speaking in your own language, please put them in and we can answer those. So I'll pass over to you, Case. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Kirk Roos. Yes, I'm working for the Research Center on Animal Production in Italy, and uh, I'm be leading the working group on uh, socioeconomic resilience, uh, together with Magda Fontes Aguiar from the Lisbon University. And um, this working group was uh, focused on the to find. Um, um, research innovations related to six uh, priority topics, which were uh, selected out of the, the grassroots needs, as has been already explained by Richard and, and Maite before. So in this um, uh, working group on socioeconomic resilience, we had um, the subject on economic planning tools, tools and strategies to manage price volatility, so risk management, initiatives to improve beef image, to promote the sustainable <laughs> examining economically efficient housing systems, 
a fairer distribution of the final price along the supply chains and the use of alternative feeds to reduce the high cost of raw materials. Okay, so these were the six um, um, subjects of the socioeconomic resilience uh, thematic group. And this thematic group uh, collected all the research and innovations related to this, uh, these uh, six topics. Altogether, about 100, almost 100 solutions have been found. Of course, there is no time to uh, illustrate all these solutions. I will have, have selected some of these. And um, the first one I would like to illustrate is the one on um, for the economic planning tools, which is the Chogask eProfit Monitor. It's an online financial analysis tool to analyze the production cost and the profitability of beef cattle farms. And it's a software which um, is enables the farmer to um, highlight the strengths and weaknesses of its farm in the financial performances. And it includes, includes also comparisons, comparisons with uh, previous years to monitor, monitor the progress in the achieving targets and to uh, it has a tool to, um, to, to compare yourself with other farms in order to see where you are your weaknesses uh, with respect to other farms. This monitor, of which has been developed by Chogask in Ireland, is um, uh, containing a lot of information about details of the products sold of the farm, details of the farm expenses, of course, and uh, it has a profit loss account and capital accounts, it's all contained in this uh, very interesting tool um, to plan your farm and to see whether you are going well on the market or if you are um, have weaknesses to improve on your farm. Another tool we, uh, which have been selected uh, for this presentation is a simulation tool for to cost home produced feed for ruminant stock. I think it's a very interesting tool because um, it allows the new farmer to reduce um, your cost of uh, producing your own feed on the farm. And this uh, grange feed costing model is developed in Excel and allows the farmer to have um, an understanding of the key relationships and the variables in inf influencing the feed crop costs. And it's also related to this topic of finding alternative feeds uh, into, in order to reduce the feed of uh, feed cost. And uh, this tool um, is a simulation tool, and it's all about um, how to produce better and a, at a lower cost your own feed on the farm. It has 68 feed crop productions within the within the the model, and it can be updated with all other new feeds as well. And it allows you to see the total feed costs of, of your farm. So it's uh, in particular in this period of high feed costs, an interesting tool to, to improve uh, your profitability from the feed cost point of view. As, in, as you all will know, it's more than 60% of the production costs is represented by feed. So it's a very important part of the production cost of the farm. And uh, within this, um, uh, topic alternative feeds. We have also found a lot of alternative feeds which are proposed by the partners in the different countries in order to, um, and this is a list of, um, of uh, alternative feeds like uh, cookie crow bars in Poland or brewer grains in Germany or grazing kale during winter time in, in Ireland. So a lot of alternatives are there on the market to be tested and uh, it's, um, you can all find the solution on the bovine knowledge hub. Then another um, innovative uh, research which have been found is related to the risk management. And one of the risks of a beef cattle farmer and in particular for finisher farms is to reduce the risks related to the, to the purchase of the calves. And in this research, which has been involving 63 beef finisher farmers in Austria, Germany, and Italy, uh, the most relevant factors to, uh, to reduce these risks, risks have been um, listed and uh, analyzed. And the, the most important one are buy to ca your cash from one, si one single farm, 
um, try to reduce the number of suppliers as most, most as possible, use a dedicated quarantine area for animals at arrival. And unfortunately, not all finisher farmers have this quarantine area, but it's essential to reduce the risk um, uh, when you're buying your calves. Prepare a health plan, apply exact rations in line with the cattle requirements, and avoid mixing of animals before transportation. If you are doing this, <clears throat> you are able to reduce in a significant way the losses of beef cattle of cattle during the finisher period, because otherwise you will have diseases and all kinds of other problems. Then um, uh, a um, research innovation which has been promoted and is still promoted by an operational group which is financed by the EU, by the regional government of Lombardy and Italy, but it's uh, finally at the end funded by the pillar two money for operational groups. And in this operational groups, um, research organizations like CRPA, but also CREA and dairy and cattle farmers are together working to to find out the best conditions to use automatic feeding systems to administer feed to, um, to the calves, to, to your animals. And this automatic feeding systems consist of uh, more or, um, one or more self-propelled electric wagons. So you're not, you're not going with a tractor in your farm, but you have a completely automatic system, electric systems, and uh, they are um, fully, and they have a fully automatic kitchen, fills the wagons with the rations to be offered to the animals. The wagons operate 24 hours a day, and they can manage different feed rations. The system also monitors the animal performances, the herd status, and provides support in establishing animal health. And here you can see two examples of two companies who have uh, developed these systems, and you see how they are moving on the lines within the farm, in the, within the barn. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the advantages of the system is it's very silent. You do not have problems with, uh, with uh, alarms or whatever. And um, from, from, for this system, we have also done a cost to benefit analysis. Within um, bovine, for a series of innovations, we have done also uh, cost-benefit analysis, like for this system. And um, we took as a basis the so-called agri-benchmark beef um, global network for the, uh, as a baseline. And we simulated the, the advantages, the cost and benefits on the baseline for uh, several farms. And uh, for this system, out of out feed system, you we can see that this system will allow you to have a better feed conversion and a higher daily weight, weight gain. You have a reduction of labor input because it's auto, completely automatic. Uh, you have a, redu a reduced fuel consumption. You will have uh, instead a little bit increased, of course, uh, consumption of electricity. But if you have solar pa panels on your roof, then you can uh, move your wagons completely in an autonomous way with the production of electricity, which is produced on the roofs of, on, the, of the, on the barns. The system is not very cheap. It's um, 172,000 euro for 600 finishing bulls. But at the end, uh, the production cost analysis uh, will show you, I will show you, that advan advantages are in particular for farms which are well, not too small, of course. There should be at least 600, 700 uh, finishing places, at least to have, to have, um, uh, to have um, a good uh, economic profitability using these farms. These uh, tables is, is in, this is in the simulation for a German farm with 280 bulls. And the, the cost variation is minus 0.3%. So you have a reduction production cost reduction of 0.3% if you're investing uh, in this system of auto feed. In this table, we show you uh, the simulation we have done on several other farms in Germany, Italy, Spain, and Ireland. And as you see, the big Spanish farm with 802 places has a reduction of the production cost of 1.6%. The 
the big one also in the in the in Italy, 0.8 percent. So there is some uh, economic advantage, but it has also much a lot of environmental uh, advantages because it's a lower consumption of of, of fuel and uh, and also animal welfare is improved because the animals are much quiet, more quiet, but because the system is very silent, electric wagons. So, so we have done this analysis of cost and benefit also for this these um, research solutions, like the application of liquid slurry with a trailing shoe, um, automatic weighing system, ceiling fans. We have done it also for cabin, establishment of the cabin season, factors able to reduce losses, which I just mentioned uh, before. We have also analyzed the cost and benefits of it. So we will find that also on the beef, on the bovine knowledge hub. Finally, I have still two other um, uh, solutions. Um, one is related to um, the um, a fairer distribution of the um, value added in the, in, the, in the supply chain. This is an example um, which is in Portugal, where local producers are able to sell their beef uh, within supermarkets. And as you all know, supermarkets have a, quite a strong bargaining power, but within with this uh, innovative solutions, producers are directly selling their products within the superstore, within the supermarket, and allows them to have a little more, a better price because they have place within the supermarket to sell their own products. And um, this is an interesting solution for uh, the producers, also for beef producers. Um, of course, you, then you have to need also the infrastructure to trans to for, for slaughtering the animals at the local slaughterhouse, which should give you the service to uh, to slaughter the animals. But uh, it has also here we have environmental um, also uh, advantages. Um, because of decrease of, decrease of transport, less fuel and less um, greenhouse gas emissions, and but the most important one is to have a better price for your end product. The biggest challenge for the big for the beef producers, of course, is the product itself, because the, there is a need for a local slaughterhouse to um, to to allow you to bring the beef in in the superstore. And finally, the last solution I would like to mention, which we have found was a solution and is a solution in Estonia, uh, which is an NGO which has been established in 2011 with the aim of obtaining a higher price for its members and marketing meat. Today, this certified grass-fed beef quality scheme has um, about 77 members in Estonia of beef producers. And um, farmers are interested in cooperating with this NGO and the meat industry. And uh, the cooperation is already on several years working well. And um, within uh, Bauwine, um, our partner, Ari Kuwet, is here as well. And she is the promoter of this uh, organization. And it's certainly um, a, an interesting uh, solution because um, it allows the farmers to have a higher price because they concentrate supply with this, within this organization. And it also um, allows the farmers to have a more stable market. And, uh, and again, another problem um, advantage is that you always get your money uh, when you're selling it. And that seems to be obvious, but not, not in all uh, in the world. It's, it's um, for sure that you have really your money back when you're buying, selling it. But most, most important is that you, the farmers, which are uh, within working within this uh, cooperation between the beef industry uh, and this association, that they have a higher price. And that's uh, uh, the main objective, of course, of this organization. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. And if you have any questions in the Q&A, we are able to, uh, to answer them. Thank you. So we just have two questions at the moment in the Q&A. Um, and the first two are related to the actual tools which you presented. So the question is, uh, are they available freely? Is there tutorials on them? Or can they find more information on these to write over themselves? 
Well, the two um, systems for um, improving the profitability uh, of Chogask, you can uh, contact uh, directly Chogask uh, to have more detailed information, both for the uh, e-profit monitor tool, as well as the tool for the, the grains feed cost uh, model. And uh, perhaps you can maybe illustrate a little bit more details, perhaps how they can contact uh, the Chogask in Ireland. And uh, it's an, in Excel, so it's a tool which uh, is, uh, can be easily used. But perhaps you can add, uh, Richard, to something. Yeah, so in, in, terms, in terms of the Grange feed costing model, this was developed by researchers themselves, so it's it's more of a tool that researchers would use at the moment. It hasn't been developed into what we would call a decision support tool for farmers or advisors to take up and easily use. Um, but it is available in an Excel format, not freely available from Chagas, but you can get a good idea of how it was formatted. So if you want to develop a similar type tool, you can do that through that structure. Um, so we've we've... If, if there's any questions, I'd like to say from our own audience here that's in participation from Bovine, please feel free to um, type them into the Q&A and we can ask a case as we speak. So there's one more question here, Case. Um, is the cost production that you gave, so it's 0.3% uh, with auto feed, uh, does this include the cost of investment in the auto feed? Yes, it's including the cost of the investment. Uh, so um, you have you are able to reduce production cost in that farm uh, of 280 places by 0.3% um, because of the fact that the benefits of, this, of the automatic feeding systems are a much better feed conversion rates rate. So you're having lower feed costs, you have lower labor costs, but which are compensated, these are compensating the um, the depreciation, the yearly depreciation of the uh, investment in the automatic feeding system. So at the end, the balance is uh, positive for the farm at the end. So 0.3%, of course, for the small farm is not so much, but if you have a little bit more animals, five, five 600 or even 1,000, of course, it becomes more profitable. That's great. Thanks, Case. Uh, so if, if, if there is any more questions, feel free for Case. If you think of any throughout the next presentation, please feel free to put them into the Q&A box as we go along. And as I said, feel free to put in in your own language if you're, if you're viewing online um, and we can ask Case and propose those to, to Case. So uh, thanks very much, Case, for your time. So our next speaker is uh, Alexander Reik. He's from the Friedrich Lofter Institute in, in Germany. And he's going to speak about the Tiamatic area, uh, animal health and welfare. Thank you, Richard. Can you please switch on the... Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, just skip this. As Richard said, I'm Alexander Rieck from the Friedrich Löffler Institute, which is the federal research institute uh, for animal health in Germany. And I was a, or I am the semantic uh, working group leader of the area animal health and welfare. And as in the presentation of Maite and Richard um, was shown already that we collected all of the semantic areas priority topics for which we then tried to find solutions. And I just listed those priority topics we had in the animal health and welfare theme um, according a bit to topics. So we had two um, topics on young animals. So one on health and welfare of newborn calves and suckler farms and one on, harm, on farm health check for young stock, also including vaccination status. And we also had one on determining causes for lameness in beef cattle, management and housing and environmental factors which affect animal welfare and rearing and finishing units, simple labor saving tools um, and training in animal welfare. And in the back, you always see the amount of solutions um, we found for those, and obviously, as also Keith said, we don't have the time to present all the solutions here today, so uh, I will give a small example, but you can find these solutions on our knowledge hub, which later Rhonda Smith from Minerva will explain a bit more about. So my first example for a solution is called infrared thermography for diagnosis of lameness. That was a solution found for the priority topic determining causes of lameness um, in beef cattle. 
Um, as you're probably aware, lameness is a real significant problem that affects overall productivity and pro also profitability in cattle operations. And several studies have shown um, that increased foot temperature detected using infrared thermography is a potential useful technique to identify lameness also early on. So it's a non-invasive tool, so you don't need to touch the animal um, and it uh, gives you reliable data. And it may even be used, what I also just mentioned already, um, that you uh, detect subclinical signs. So something that is not visible yet, and the animal is also not lame yet, but it already has an infection and increased temperature, you would detect it with this technique. So far, it has been mainly used in dairy cattle, but it's increasingly also used in beef cattle. So here you see some pictures from our demonstrations for this solution. Um, on the left, you can see uh, my colleague Karen von Dylan, who is not here today, but who also was involved in the project, taking ER image of a lame um, bull. Here you can see animals um, through driving, and obviously that's very quick, but you can then use those still Im images and check each animal if there is an increased uh, heat uh, available or, or detected on these hooves. And here you can see um, the comparison between two different ca camera systems, because there's a wide range of devices available by now. Some cost thousands and some are pretty cheap. You also get apps for uh, mobile phones by now, which also work quite well. So that's really a, a different range, whatever you, you prefer or what you need. Obviously the more expensive one are a bit more sophistic sophisticated and have more uh, abilities to uh, analyze the data. But nevertheless, all, all of them give you a picture of that animal and if there's an inflammation or not. So with infrared thermography, it's possible to diagnose lameness early and to clarify suspicion, which I think is one of the strengths of the solution that you, before the animal actually shows sign of sickness, you can detect uh, inflammation with that. The problem sometimes is that you need to be rather close to the animal. So you uh, can't do it on the field or somewhere else. So it needs to be at least uh, two meters apart. It should be on a flat floor. Um, as I said, maximum two meters distance free field of view. And sometimes it's also obviously necessary to fixate the animal because if they move very quickly and you don't get a clear picture, you just have to fixate the animals then. And it's also advisable always to use a second leg as a comparison to see really the temperature differences between legs. Um, from farmers on the uh, demonstrations, we also got the hints or the, the um, uh, points that you basically also can use this for other purposes. Uh, for example, also use the smartphone app um, with for infrared thermography to check the post heating of silage, or also to check the filling of the biogas plant. Those are just some side effects you also can use it for. And in the um, literature, they also used it already for checking the respiration rate in calves. Or in another project from Finland, they used it for the detection of uh, early milk fever and also for hoof health. Um, you saw all the time this um, QR code here on the top left. This will lead you to this article um, link here. And in the article, there will be all the other links. I will show you also for the other um, solutions, which then, as I said earlier on Minerva will show you um, or Rhonda will show you where they are on the bovine knowledge hub. But we also did two demonstrations here, one in Germany and also one in Belgium. The next solution I would like to present is called on farm scoring of bovine respiratory disease or short BRD. It was a, a solution we found for the priority topic, simple labor saving tools uh, to measure and communicate high animal welfare standards on bee farms. Um, as you probably aware, bovine respiratory disease um, is the most common cause for uh, mortality and morbidity in feedlot cattle. Um, and various studies already showed um, the negative effects also on BRD, of BRD on crows, um, daily gain and so on. And the combination of this new scoring system and a spe specific app developed for this um, really helped to uh, reduce also the BRD prevalence. 
and improve also mean calf health. And the tool is designed to be herd specific, uh, so help producers identify the risk of their calves and the management changes needed to control this disease. The system or this uh, app was developed by the UC Davis in California, that's a university. And the scoring system is actually quite simple. It's uh, based on six clinical signs, each of which is a score assigned. So you see the, the scoring sheet here on the right. Um, the six clinical signs are eye discharge, nasal discharge, ear drop or hair tilt, cough, breathing and temperature. And for each of those um, clinical signs, you get a score. Uh, for eye discharge, for example, you get a score of two. For nasal discharge, four. Ear drop and head tilt a bit higher because obviously if this is a sign, then there is likely an infection, so you should uh, treat it. Uh, cough two, breathing two, and temperature also two. And the simple thing about it is that there's always only a yes or no. There is no crating or like it's a bit severe, it's a less severe. If there is any kind of eye discharge, you will score it and the app will automatically give the appropriate score. The same for nasal discharge. Um, you, you check if there is a nasal discharge, if there's non-nasal discharge, obviously you get zero. If there is one, you get four or the app will add four and so on. Also for cough, breathing, temperature, ear drop and head tilt and everything equal or above five should be treated. So if, if the score is five or higher, then you should definitely consult a veterinarian and the animal should be treated. If it's below five, obviously, obviously you should monitor the animal, but there is no intervention needed yet. That's why also, for example, you get this high score here for ear drop and head tilt. You definitely should intervene if that happens, because as I said, there is likely an infection involved and that obviously should be treated. So the BID scoring system is suitable for use on farms because of its simple design. You can easily just have it on your mobile phone and it can help to provide sensible medical uh, intervention in BID cases. And also if it's not the case, reduce the treatment that would be unnecessary. So also um, reduce the use of antibiotics. Yeah, just a few um, screenshots of the app. You have user details, calf details, which you can uh, use the input for and just type in all this pretty easy. And then you have these six clinical signs you can go through. Eye discharge, always with example pictures, normal one, and then a couple of uh, example pictures where there is uh, um, eye discharge present. Same for nasal discharge. And then the app will obviously add the scores automatically. And everything below, as a <clears throat> excuse me, um, below five um, will be. Uh, you don't need to intervene yet, but everything above five, it will get red. Then, then you should intervene and consult a veterinarian. So very easy to use, and you can go from calf to calf and um, check your scores for these animals. Also, here we um, have quite a bit of material on the bovine hub. Um, we had two demonstrations in Germany uh, at the FLI and the BRS, and also a demonstration in Spain, which actually was very helpful because they also translated all these material, the fact sheets, the score sheet, and so on, and they're also available on the hub. The next um, solution I would like to present is called ventilation tubes to ensure healthy cattle. Um, it um, was collected for the priority topic management, housing and environmental factors, which, is, which affect animal welfare in rearing and finishing units. And that is a very practical um, solution because as we all know, with climate change, the number of hot days in the next years will definitely increase. And especially in Germany, all barns are often closed on all three sides. And I think that's not only in Germany and in combination with this low dung mattress, and the low ceiling, um, you get very poor air quality in those barns. And obviously poor air quality can lead to disease like what I just showed earlier, BRD and so on. So to improve um, the air quality in those kinds of barns, um, there is a pretty simple way to, without you know, knocking down the whole barn or building a new barn, uh, improving air quality in the barn. So basically what is done, um, you force air through a fan that is connected to the barn through a tube 
that depending obviously on the barn, but it's approximately 30 meters long. And the tube have small openings. These are the small black dots here you can see where the air is distributed evenly throughout the barn. Um, the hose um, should be made of washable textile so that no uh, that condensation water can collect and then bacteria or fungi can grow. So it should be washable. And um, like actual practical experience show that the system can significantly improve air quality. So it's not so much um, a system to now reduce heat stress, for example, you need additional intervention for this, but it definitely improves air quality in a barn. And here's just a small clip from a um, demonstration in, in Belgium, where they used smoke to make this visible, the airflow. And you can nicely see how really the air gets distributed evenly on all sides. Um, and um, if this wouldn't happen, this, the air on hot days, for example, would you know go down and there would be no circulation at all. So this is an easy and not very cost-effective solution. Uh, not, I mean, not very expensive solution um, to um, improve air quality in old barns. Also here we have, again, like if you scan this, you get to the material on the bovine hub. And the last solution I would like to show you is called thoracic squeeze technique in newborn calves with male adjustment syndrome. It's from the priority topic health and welfare of newborn calves and suckler farms. And I don't know if you all know this, um, some of the practitioners will know it. Um, dummy calves, what are those calves that are typically calves that are indifferent to their environment? Lack the affinity of the dam, um, usually fail to find the other. And even if you help them to find the other, they usually don't suckle um, and are basically uninterested uh, in their environment and usually motionless. And those calves usually die or they need really expensive and um, costly interventions. And um, in dummy foals, this technique I will just present, this was already or is already practiced um, since many years. It's also called Medigan squeeze technique because the guy who invented it was called Medigan. And it has been very use, uh, successfully used um, in horses, so in fowls. And since uh, a short while it's also done in calves, especially by George Stilwell, who uh, is also involved in this project, who also wrote a really nice paper for it, uh, which you also find the link uh, in the hub. And slowly that's really also done in other animals. And what happens there is that um, the physical compression of the chest helps the newborn um, with this uh, male adjustment syndrome. And what the compression does is actually to induce a slow wave sleep and hormone changes in the animal. I won't go into the details now what that means from hormone side and from the endocrinology side, but if you're interested, there's a, as I just mentioned, a really nice article by George, where this is nicely explained what really happens in the animal. So the calves is subjected to this technique for 20 minutes with a soft rope, should be not more than three centimeters wide, passed around the chest and abdomen. And the calf is then forced to lie down during that time with a loop tightened. Um, and after a short struggle, usually the calf um, goes into a deep sleep for about 20 minutes. The calf is then awakened and usually gets up. And um, if all worked well, it behaves like a normal calf. As I said, this is not like a miracle or whatever. There are hormone and endocrinological changes um, happening in the calf during that sleep. So as I said, if you're interested, read the article. Also here, we have quite a bit of material, um, demonstrations done in Ireland, Portugal, and Germany. Portugal also did a webinar on it, which is very interesting. And also cost benefit analysis was done on this. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Great. Thank, thank you very much, um, Alexander. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat, and I suppose just to invite people to put questions either relating to Case's presentation or your presentation into the questions and answers. And we do, um, we'll try to translate them, so feel free to put them in in your own national language. So just the first question um, is, how early uh, do you recognize lameness in advance of any symptoms with the aid of the infrared thermo thermography? 
that obviously depends quite on the severeness of the infection. But um, what I mean, the demonstrations that were done in Germany, you could, there was one example where the farmer did not suspect that actually they found an animal the farmer did not suspect would be lame. So you can see underneath the skin, obviously you won't see it visible, but that there is a higher heat. So there is a small infection. And if you detect this, it can be definitely before the animal gets lame, but it depends definitely on the case. So it's it's difficult to say now exact time frame, two days, one day. It always depends, obviously, also on the on the um, germ that infects it. So, but it can be a good clinical sign before it actually comes apparent. Great, thank you. And then the next question is, which app for the mobile phone is the best for the infrared thermography? Oh. <laughs> I can't make uh, advertisements here now, but uh, there are a wide range. I just just look in the app store. If you just type in infrared thermography, there are quite a few. So I, I wouldn't recommend now one because then you get in trouble here. So okay, great. Because it was a very specific yeah. question: is is there a, the, is the app available in the Netherlands? And there was also a question: is it available in Italy? And what name? But I think you're suggesting just to uh, just, just search. Know, if, if it's available in your country, we will see it in the app store, whatever. In the Apple or on the Android, um, I wouldn't know now for the Netherlands or Italy if they are available, but just check it. I mean, I mean, if, for those who are really interested, it probably makes sense if they use it more often to invest a bit into a real camera then because they're obviously a bit more sophisticated and also have tools to analyze the data that come out of those. Okay, great. And vets, um, vets have that type of some, equipment? Some vets use it uh, yeah. like regularly when they go to farms. So. Okay, great. And then there was a question, um, will you be able to identify animals with subclinical BRD using the visual scoring system? Um, you, that's that's a that's a good part of this. That obviously you wouldn't um, you wouldn't probably go to a score to five or above if it's subclinical. But you might have if they have a bit of nasal discharge or a bit of eye discharge, maybe a bit of cough or one of these, you would detect it and say, oh, okay, that could be something, but it's not above five yet. So I don't need to intervene, but you should monitor the animal then. And then obviously continuously, if this increases and goes above five, then you would uh, intervene. But it's definitely also a tool to, you know, if it just gets two points, a slight cough, uh, a bit of nasal discharge, it's not so, too severe. You don't need to intervene and give antibi antibiotics immediately, but you could um, monitor the animal. And if it becomes more severe, then take action. Great, and uh, we have a compliment here, very nice presentation. Sorry, I've just got, got it lost, just one second. And there was a question along with a compliment. Um, very interesting presentation. Have you used thoracic ultrasound sonography to detect subclinical and clinical BRD lesions? I don't know if you can comment on that. No, we, I mean, we didn't use that. I mean, that, because we gathered obviously the, the practical and something that's because with that, you obviously need a bet to do this um, or the, device which might be not that cheap um, but uh, i heard about it but we didn't use it you know it's not any demonstrations great and there is one in another language there richard you might see if you can translate that i can't see what that's in uh, we could do the Google Translate on that, but I think just um, while we're waiting for that final question to be translated, and um, we have a little bit of time to um, ask some more questions. And I think um, we have an expression in Ireland. It's always useful to hear from the horse's mouth. And um, so, a uh, case had mentioned one example of the uh, from our Estonian colleagues, whereby the um, NGO was linked with the uh, with the the meat companies. Um, and we have the, the person here um, who was very much involved in that. So we're going to just invite Ari to come up and maybe just briefly give us a little bit more insight into that. And I suppose how, how bovine would have worked with her in that. So um, we have the, no, well, yeah, do, okay, so thanks. But, but I think, we, you know, it's great to have the, 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 the real person here. So if anybody has any uh, questions for Ari, in addition to Alex and Case, you can add those to us in a minute as well. Thank you. Thank you. As I understood, um, the question was how wine helped uh, the uh, cooperation with um, Livima Lihaveis and uh, our partner Meat Factory, Dinama Meat Factory. And otherwise, the wine project uh, is actually brilliant <laughs> with this, how it's uh, built up uh, about um, uh, collecting the um, ideas, what farmers needs, and then uh, like sorting this out. 
And for our case, uh, Bovine Project helped in, in different levels. With, with this part of the uh, cooperation with farmer organization and uh, meat factory, the main issue that the meat factory and our uh, cooperation with farmers has that we are uh, producing grass-fed beef and the meat, meat factory is uh, trying to sell it with the best price. And there has always been a problem that how we can get the, the better marbling with grass-fed. It's very easy when you are grain feed, it's just ration, different parts of uh, rations uh, added. But with grass-fed, it's, it's more and more difficult. And uh, uh, as, as Bovine uh, uh, gathered uh, different countries uh, with the farmers, that then we figured out that there was other partners, other countries also that was interesting about grass-fed. And that's why there was um, uh, came up the question how to get more marbling into the meat. And uh, then thanks to that, the uh, academic partners from other countries uh, get a lot of uh, academic papers about vitamin A, about different um, uh, actions, how you can increase the marbling. And now we, uh, connection with the, with the meat factory, we are using this information to help our farmers and, uh, and understand more how we can get, uh, again, the marbling into meat. But this is the one part of the uh, cooperation. But me as a farmer, I can say that also because I have a farm. Uh, when we, and I'm a net network manager also, and when we started to collect these uh, good practices, it was quite hard at, at, at first because it, it seemed that, that every good practice that we have as a farmer, uh, and our farmers is uh, obvious that everybody knows it. That how I can show it as good practice for other people. But uh, then when the first round has been done already and we, I, I read the different countries' good practices, I figured out that, Jesus, that it's not that obvious. And I found for my farm, at, at least I found a very good practice because it was, I think it was German. Uh, but was, there was this description about the farm who had a problem with um, uh, newborn calf diarrhea and how the farmer solved it. And I had exactly the same problem. So, and I, I, um, I solved it exactly the same way. Now it's the second year and I don't have any my data vaccination and now I don't have uh, any diarrhea calf at my home. So. So uh, this is a short <laughs> description how, how bovine works. And um, for information, one thing more. Now we are at the end of the project, but from my point of view, uh, the, uh, this thing only starting right now because this hub is full of good information and it's very important that uh, different countries um, uh, advisors and, uh, and um, uh, veterinarians will use it and, uh, and disturb it dis uh, and uh, disseminate it to, to farmers. And we just need to translate. It's the only thing we need to do with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arya. As I said, it's great to hear from the horse's mouth and some great, I think, pearls of wisdom there. And I think just the point that Ari made about um, farmers not recognizing themselves as innovators and not recognizing that what they're doing is of interest to others. I think that's a useful observation. And I suppose it's, it's something that we, we after in the afternoon with the Bovine Consortium, we're actually meeting policymakers here in, in Brussels. And the point we'll be bringing home to them is that farmers are innovators and they can come up with a lot of the solutions as well. And that, um, th that approach needs to be very much um, encouraged and supported as well. And um, as Ari said, you know, there's a lot of content gathered by Bovine over the last three years by the great experts uh, from an academic perspective and from a practitioner perspective who were involved in Bovine. And you will hear at the end of the morning about how you can access um, all of that. Um, so do we have other questions, Richard? I think we had an, another one there, did we? Um, so, oh, I think that's for um, Alex. So with regards to the Madigan squeeze, does the rope stay on the chest all the time while putting the animal to sleep? Does this technique work every time? So you want to get somebody looking for a guarantee there. Um, I, I, I'm actually not the person who would be able to answer this because the practitioners who do this, they know how exactly to do this. This is for us a solution we picked up and said, hey, that works for the farmer who has this kind of problem. And the people who actually 
apply it? Uh, veterinarians, trained people, and one would need to ask those. Now, maybe I give the microphone shortly to Lena because Lena did a demonstration on this and she is a vet and they also tried this out on a dummy calf. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, to answer the question, the rope stays on the animal the whole time, the whole 20 minutes, and it has to be squeezed the whole time, actually. So uh, get in a good position that you can hold the rope straight uh, for the 20 minutes. Um, this is quite important. And um, the second part of the question, ah, so um, it doesn't work 100%. You'd never have 100% in these cases. Um, but if the uh, so it's very important to clarify if this is a dummy calf or if there are other other causes for um, the situation of the calf but if it is a dummy calf it works very nicely i don't have a percentage uh, number now uh, but it works very good um, some animals need a second treatment and it's quite important to do this technique in the first uh, three days uh, of uh, the living of the calf uh, otherwise, it won't work uh, this well. So thank you very much. But I think, you know, like a lot of things we're, we're saying, you know, not, don't necessarily do this at home. Do be sure that you have the appropriate diagnosis and that it is, in fact, a dummy calf. And so we're not saying to go out and do that for all calves that are not getting up. So uh, do be very sensible in terms of how you how you implement the, the practice. There is a lot of information available, but you do need to understand what you're doing. And um, because obviously from an animal welfare point of view, it wouldn't be good to inappropriately <laughs> undertake such um, practices. Um, so we have another question here. Um, when you say don't intervene, just monitor, I think that's with regard to the, the, the BRD. Um, what about use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories as their use on some clinic, clinic, subclinical BRD can stop it developing to a score of five, of greater than five? I would also give this to the veterinarian because I'm not a vet. As I said, we collected those who, that work the best and maybe Lina can answer. So um, when you say don't intervene, just monitor, what about the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories as their use on some on subclinical BRD can stop it developing to a score of greater than five? Uh, I would uh, really much appreciate this method uh, to, to intervene or to do some kind of uh, intervention without using antibiotics. This can be very, very useful, I guess, uh, to stop um, the illness from developing any further. Um, the only disadvantage in this method, in my opinion, is that, uh, of course, you, if the calf would develop a high temperature, you would put it down with these medicals. So maybe you won't detect a high temperature in the calf. But um, I would still recommend to do this method to stop the illness from developing, yes. Great, thank you. And I suppose just again, very much emphasizing the multi-actor approach. We have vets involved here, farmers, advisors, vets, cooperatives, NGOs, we're, we're all in this together. Uh, we have another question. Um, did the project evaluate the main causes of mortality of the different herds in different countries? Well, I suppose I can take that one myself. Um, that wasn't really the objective, and I don't think we have any um, background information on that. I mean, we knew there was an issue with dummy calves, um, and then we just identified a solution, but we didn't do any analysis of um, causes of mortality or levels of mortality um, across countries. I just, yeah. That's why I um, uh, um, suggested the present uh, the, the the paper from George. He has a nice introduction why this is done and how often that could happen and so on. So who's interested, just go to the hub and and download the the article. Who's also a link in on there. Thank you very much. And it's actually very useful that we have this um, slide still available up here. Um, I think it just um, one of the things that it shows is that when we identified the solutions from research, we knew they were not ready to be put into practice yet. So what we did then was demonstrated them in a commercial farm context. Now, obviously, we weren't able to do that for all um, research innovations because, you know, there are seasonal reasons or cost reasons or whatever. Um, but for in this example, and there are others, you can see that it was demonstrated demonstrated in Ireland, Portugal, Germany. So some of these solutions are very amenable to being implemented across um, other countries. And as a result of the demonstrations, we were able to identify some of the 
the issues with regards to implementing. Um, other solutions are not um, as easily translated across, but we do have um, information. If you go onto the Bovine Knowledge Hub to see which ones were, were demonstrated and in which countries, and that will give you a flavor for which um, solutions can be easily uh, or are more easily translated um, across countries. Um, so any further questions from the audience or from our members who are joining in remotely? Um, we have had over 500 people registered um, for, for this event, so we're very pleased with that. And um, mostly from European countries, um, but some also outside of Europe. Um, so we do expect that we'll have a number of um, people uh, um, joining in on the day. And as I said, recordings of this will be available so people can, can look at it after afterwards as well. I think we have some more questions here. Um, so with regards to BRD again, NSAID in subclinical BRD may not be indicated because it will reduce inflammation that is fighting the infection. And that's from our famous George Stirwell, who was joining us uh, online. So thanks, George, very much for that, that comment. Um, and there is going to be an addition about the ultrasound scanning based on a demonstration done in Belgium. So um, Karen is going to add to add a comment on that. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, in Belgium, in fact, we combined the demonstration on the visual science together with a demonstration using the ultrasound scanning method. And it was in collaboration with a project from Ghent University, Pneumonie. And they are training uh, veterinarians um, to implement a very fast scanning method with ultrasound to detect also subclinical um, pneumonia. And we did an experiment with the farmers uh, at the demonstration to recognize um, yeah, respiratory disease and pneumonia based on the visual signs and based on the ultrasound scanning. And we saw that it was not so obvious to identify all animals with subclinical pneumonia. The demonstration is also on the hub. So. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, so, uh, do we have any other questions from anybody here or from our online community? I think we were conscious that uh, we don't always get to, to, to engage well with our, the online panel, so we did leave quite a bit of time for, for the discussion there. Um, I suppose just to you know, the comment on the, the Bovine Knowledge Hub, you'll be hearing more details about the various content, but just to alert you to the fact that the website and the hub will be continuing on um, beyond the, the lifetime of the project. It will actually stay live for three more years. Um, and if you actually um, undertake, uh, adopt any of the good practice or research innovations, and you have any learnings to share with others, you can still comment um, and put that that knowledge into the, the knowledge hub and um, you can access the knowledge hub for, for free but if you want to put in some comments you actually just need to register and um, so if, if you want to, to provide some comments as and share your experience with other farmers and um, across europe you can still do that for three more years beyond the lifetime of the project and um, so any final contributions from from our group here no. OK, so we're actually going to um, we were leaving ourselves a little bit tight on time with regards to the break. And um, so we're actually going to, to um, indulge ourselves by taking a slightly longer break and we will come back according to the time that was on the agenda, which brings us back at a uh, quarter past um, 11 uh, Brussels time. So thank you very much, everybody. And we look forward to rejoining with you at a quarter past 11. Thank you. One So welcome back, everybody. Um, for those of you who didn't join us before the break, this is the final dissemination conference of the Bovine Thematic Network. Uh, we had two sessions before the morning uh, dealing with the two thematic areas of relevance to, socio to the um, sustainability of the beef sector. Uh, we looked at socioeconomic resilience, 
and animal health and welfare. So now we're going to have two sessions dealing with production efficiency, one session dealing with production efficiency and meat quality, and one dealing with environmental sustainability. And finally, we will have um, a presentation that will signpost you towards the various resources within bovine that can help to enhance the sustainability of the beef farming sector in Ireland, or in Europe, sorry, I beg your pardon. So I'll hand you over now to Virginia Rusconi from the University of Zaragoza. Okay, thank you, Meg. And um, good morning, everybody. So, um, as, as she said, I'm Virginia Resconi from the University of Zaragoza. And, and uh, I'm not sure if this is yeah, the last version. Um, I'm going to, to show uh, solutions to priority topics. So, uh, the solutions, as we have already here, they came from research, they came from good practices from farmers, and also from demonstrations. Uh, the uh, six priority topics from my thematic area are described uh, here, and I'm going to, to talk about some solutions briefly, and um, uh, so not in detail, and, and I'm, uh, of course I don't have to time, time to speak about everything, uh, but I also have to, uh, want to say that it's not that I'm only talking about the web, the best ones. So maybe you can find something more interesting uh, when you search in the, in the website. So the first priority topic is about animal monitoring tools in the fattening phase. So the main um, uh, task of these uh, uh, tools is to save uh, time and, and a force from, from farmers. And I'm going to talk uh, about two of uh, the solutions identified, that is virtual fencing and automated weight. So about virtual fencing, in, uh, in we had a, a, a sharing in a, in a webinar, a special webinar, where it was explained what is about the virtual fencing and uh, experience of a project that is developing these systems in mountain areas in, in Spain. So um, this, uh, this example is already is, is a pilot. It's not a commercial device uh, uh, right now, but uh, we have phoned the, the farmer that was uh, where uh, this system was uh, test, tested. And uh, he said that uh, the system works, keep the animals in the, the, lim the limited place and avoiding risk of them falling in dangerous mountain areas. So he, he would be happy to use uh, this kind of systems gives peace of mind knowing where the animals are, uh, but for the moment is still expensive. Uh, there are also some devices that are already commercialized. And also in the webinar, we, we hear from Russ Carrington from UK, uh, his experience using no fence uh, collars. Uh, and he, he made some practical points uh, showing, for example, that the, the animals learn very quickly to use the, the system. Uh, there are also other devices. This is in uh, a halter device from UK. Uh, you can see that the system also can help to move the animals. So uh, I think uh, this, um, this uh, tool can be very useful, for example, well, for, for, for different grazing managements. For example, in holistic management can be very useful. And also in rewilding projects or fair wall uh, or, or, or or to use uh, cattle as a fair firewall. Uh, about automated weight, uh, also there were uh, there were many many demonstrations going on in Poland, in in, in Ireland, in Belgium, and in and in Italy, and uh, also in the web uh, you can see some some videos with more specific information. Uh, also from Spain, we have a, a talk of a researcher that uh, was working developing a, uh, um, a device in, in Spain. And uh, for example, one of, uh, of the comments that uh, maybe uh, farmers are interested to know is, uh, of course, is in, in, the, in the conditions he study uh, in, in Cordoba in Spain. So it's not even represented all, all Spain. But uh, uh, he said that by, by helping farmer to define the optimal slaughter time uh, uh, with a, uh, in a batch with 39 calves, it can save uh, nearly uh, 2,000 euros per, per batch. Uh, another priority topic is about the use of available data to improve carcass and meat quality. So uh, there are a lot of uh, information, a lot of data, mainly, to, uh, for example, for traceability, for, for, for a consumer safety perspective. 
but this data uh, can be is there and, and and would be great to to take profit of, of this data and, and and use it for 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 farmers so uh, here I, I'm, I'm going to show two examples they they're coming from from Ireland and one of these is the prediction of carcass value at the time of, of sale. So it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it can be very interesting when, when, uh, when, um, uh, when uh, uh, someone is going to buy a calf to know how much uh, will cost or how, how much will be the price of the carcass. So uh, with some information, we can know more or less uh, how the animal will perform. But with this tool that is called beef on worth, the idea is to use genetic merit of the of the animals and and to use also information about uh, non-genetic uh, effects from their own animal, uh, such as the birth uh, year, if it's a twin, the life weights, and also non-genetic uh, factors uh, from the dam. And with all the, this information, uh, uh, be able to predict the the, the carcass uh, price. So this is a pilot innovation that is being integrated in the Irish Cattle Beef Federation database. Uh, and the use, uh, this is, can be useful because it provides the buyer with uh, more confidence in what is buying. And also uh, very important that is encourage the seller to be more focused on breeding for, for beer ca uh, carcass trade, but because maybe if he's, he's a suckler uh, um, beef farm, they, maybe he, he, he was not paying attention to, to this uh, trait, but also for, for dairy, dairy farmers. So dairy farmers also can start to think that if they sell uh, calves uh, that are then better to, to, to fatten, uh, so what, then we will have a more efficient um, production. Uh, the future is to, to, to build uh, different tools also in other animals uh, destined for, for slaughter. Uh, also another, another interesting um, um, development or innovation is about a genetic improvement for eating quality. So the idea uh, is uh, to take the information, uh, information from carcass classification data and data collected in, in primal cats but then has a, a panelist uh, with trained people that tastes the meat and, 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 and we can have information about tenderness, juiciness, and flavor. And uh, with that information, we can know how we can improve uh, by genetics the, this, um, these traits. So here we can see that there is variation across uh, breeds, but maybe more important is that there is variation within, within breeds. So it's possible to, to, to improve. Uh, and, and what is in, interesting uh, about in, improvement in genetic is that is uh, cumulative and, uh, and, and permanent. Of course, then it has to be uh, a, a other uh, non-genetic uh, factors uh, to have this, uh, this quality. And here we have the words of Andrew Cromie from the uh, Irish Cattle Beef uh, Federation. And he's saying, that it was a challenge to collect accurate the sensory data uh, uh, and now in the future will be a challenge to um, to find in a fair way to economically reward stakeholders uh, for beef quality but uh, maybe this is the, the 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 way we have to think forward in the future we need to to provide um, meat with a high quality another priority topic uh, it was related about animal feeding and the stress and, and meat quality. And I will uh, first talk about uh, feeding. So uh, I, here I, I am showing two examples uh, that is related to, to circularity. Uh, some uh, these examples, we, um, some, some partners and some farmers uh, had the opportunity to visit in Navarra this, uh, uh, this place. Uh, so we, we were able to, to learn and, 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 and everything and, and to smell and to, to ask uh, specific questions. So I'm not going to talk uh, in detail, but the idea is uh, maybe, uh, maybe here uh, in Bobine, we're trying to find solutions for beef, but um, maybe here is uh, the cattle is helping to, to find solutions to other problems. The, so to, to take uh, use of uh, uh, agriculture byproducts. So uh, using, uh, for example, uh, vegetable byproducts, or in this example, bakery um, byproducts, 
uh, it's possible to, to reduce uh, waste, but also to, to have a solution for a farmer. For example, this uh, solution was uh, identified in, in Poland, and they said that in the, in the 100 days, uh, the last date of finishing, if uh, they replace 50% of the, of the cereal with, uh, with this product, they, they found improvement in, in marbling and also uh, reducing cost of the, of the feeding. Uh, another part of this priority topic is about the stress. And here I, I show two examples. And, and I think this, uh, these examples are also very interesting because it's, it's what, what we were supposed to, to do in bovine. So our technical working group uh, find uh, two research uh, innovations, and then th those innovations were, uh, were carried out as a demonstration. This is in, in, in Germany, and this is in, in, in Estonia. Uh, this one is related to gentle touching in early life that can have effect in the, in the, in the meat uh, quality. And uh, the other one is about um, the, the other one is a, uh, about uh, the using of appeasing um, pheromones to reduce stress. And so then uh, after, after showing these innovations in the, in the, in the project, uh, this was demonstrated. And, and here we can see a farmer in Germany that uh, tried this technique and uh, it's not necessary to explain too much. Here we can, have, we can see the good relationship, human and animal relationship that uh, was uh, obtained. And uh, in, in Estonia, for example, uh, after this, um, this presentation, uh, now they are buying this product, uh, the, the pheromones, they find, they find the, the product cheap and easy to apply. So it, it was a, 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 a success. Uh, then here we have another topic, and this uh, topic is, uh, is really huge topic, uh, which is optimizing the number of calves per cow per year in suckler beef herds. Uh, what is interesting about this uh, topic is that because sometimes uh, we have a topic and, and we, we find a solution and we have a positive point in something, but then we have a, pot, a negative point in, uh, in, a different, in, a, in a different area. But uh, with, uh, with this uh, um, uh, taking care of this uh, or improving this topic, we can have benefits in, in, in the fourth of the thematic areas from, from bovine. So all, all is positive. Uh, and I'm going to show three, three examples. Here we have a, a farm in, in Italy that is not only one good practice, so it's several good practices. So in this, uh, in this farm, they use a specific diets for, for different types of animals, for heifers, lactin, or dry cows, calves before or after calving. They conduct also diagnosis of pregnancy with ultrasound after uh, 70 days uh, with the bulls and then uh, two, two more. Before calving, the, the animals, the cows are moved to a calving area to take care um, more carefully of, of them. And, and also they are attached with a calving sensor as you can see here in the tail. So uh, when, when the cow is, is, is going to, to have the calving, uh, the, the farmer is notified in, in case it's necessary um, to, to intervene. Uh, after calving, then it's checked uh, if the uterus is in place. And, and then one month later, mothers and calves are moved uh, uh, in pens with the bulls and the cycle start again. Uh, also, well, the, the lactin calves uh, have access to, to feed and they are regularly weighted. And with all these good practices, they, they, the, the, the calving interval was reduced to 382 days, which is uh, less than the national average. And also the calves mortality uh, was uh, low. And here we have another, another solution coming from, from France. And here the farmer says, uh, like uh, he doesn't have unproductive females. So what uh, what he does is that all the females that are born all are mated, and after calving, he decides if the cow is going for breeding or for fattening. So the uh, the idea is to have all the females inseminated before grazing. That is in the end of of March, and uh, with this uh, system. Uh, what he find interesting is that he can test all the females before making a choice which one is going to 
to, to be for breeding. The renewal rate of this farm is, is, is higher than, than usual. Uh, in that way also uh, the, the females are very uh, productive. And also another, uh, another interesting point is that the cool cows are always young. So they are less from, from six years. So they are not penalized uh, the price of the carcass. So uh, they take uh, this uh, advantage as well. Uh, with, with this, uh, with this uh, strategy, uh, the, the Calvin interval is reduced, is less than 370 days. And here we have another, another uh, solution. This, uh, this time it comes from, from Germany. And, and we know that first mating is very important because if the mating is, uh, is, uh, is the first mating is too early, we can have or we can see health problems in calves and, and cows. If it's late, uh, we will have a low production efficiency, but if it's in the right timing, then we will have cows with a long and, and productive life. So it's important to, to define this, this moment, depends on age, life weight, and physical maturity. So we can, we can use scales and, 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 and do it uh, weighting the animals, but here is, a, is another idea that is more uh, easy, more, more cheap, that is just to use a tape measure and to measure the thoracic uh, circumference uh, to predict the, the, the breed. And uh, of course, the, this has to be developed for, for different breeds, but can be um, uh, an, uh, uh, a nice solution. Then uh, I'm going to talk about another priority to topic that it is about tools to evaluate the carcass and meat quality prior to and in the slaughterhouse. And here I'm going to show three examples. So one is from, from Estonia. Uh, we have already here from Case and, and, from, and from Airy uh, that they're working in a, in a grass beef, uh, grass-fed uh, beef with a, um, with a um, uh, quality uh, um, brand. And uh, so they are interested in, in improving marbling as, as she has already said. And, and here I'm, I'm showing you what, uh, what they do. So they, they from, from this year in May, they start to, to measure the, just to measure the beef marbling using the Australian uh, grading system and taking photographs. And then they use all this information and this information is coming back to the farmer and uh, with, the, with the pictures. And, and, and this is very important if, uh, if, uh, if uh, farmers want to, to improve uh, uh, marbling. Uh, and also uh, for, for the marketing perspective to know in Estonia, uh, which is the, the level of marine they, they have already and what the, they, can, they can do or what they can do. Uh, the mapping is free for uh, cost uh, for the farmer. And here we have some words of uh, farmers saying that they know that customers and consumers want marbled meat. So, and, and having this information is useful. And, and this uh, farmer is saying that uh, he would like to make uh, changes if the animal management to produce uh, more marbled meat uh, uh, from grasslands. And then here we have a, an application from, from France. Uh, this is also, this is not uh, commercialized uh, yet, but soon it will be. And the idea is just to take uh, a photograph of the, of the meat and with, uh, with this photo, you can have the marbling and the, the content of, of, of intramuscular fat and also external um, fat is, uh, from, the, from the cut. So it's a very interesting tool. In France, it seems that also they're interested in increased uh, marbling and they are working in their own, uh, in their own grading uh, system that is also available in the, in the Knowledge Hub if, if you want to, to take a look. And another interesting tool uh, could be to know uh, the meat quality, but before the, the animal is, uh, is in the slaughterhouse, so when it's alive. So uh, here, uh, of course, this, this uh, methodology is also used in, 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 in other countries, may, maybe since many years, many years, but in Europe it's not, well, um, it's not very uh, common to use. And in Portugal, they did a... Um, a demonstration expert came uh, to explain how the system works. And, uh, and, and as I said, although it, it requires expertise, 
but maybe can be interested uh, if we want to to improve to improve quality, not not only not only modeling. Uh, because this topic was of high interest, we we set up a, a webinar uh, with a uh, French researchers talking about different topics about this uh, Marlin and also from UK, uh, uh, explaining some practical uh, solutions. Uh, then we have uh, another uh, topic here that is confirm strategies to improve uh, Marlin tenderness and color in beef meat. And uh, here I'm going to, to show uh, three examples. So these examples come from Belgium, uh, from Belgium, and is called Meat Plus. The idea is to use uh, DNA um, information and, and then to use uh, this information to know which carcasses uh, will, will be more tender. And so it's a guarantee for tenderness. This, uh, this um, methodology has a great uh, exception uh, in the in in Belgium, right now 60 per, uh, 70 percent of of the animals are already uh, meat plus, and the idea is to have 100 percent of the animals with this uh, with this um, uh, guarantee. And here we also can listen the voice of a farmer saying that uh, that every beef farmer knows now which uh, breeding bulls are meat plus and we'll choose these bulls. For the future of the breed is very important knowledge. And here is another uh, commercial genetic uh, test available. And, and here uh, in the website, you can find more information where, how this, uh, this uh, uh, tool work. But here I can show you uh, uh, the words of a, of a Germany um, beef um, uh, farmer that he's saying that this is a fantastic tool to rank uh, cattle. Uh, he said that he, he don't decide 100% by genomics, but this is uh, useful information. And also uh, a farmer from, from Estonia that is using this, uh, this uh, methodology and also encouraging, uh, encouraging more, more farmers to, to use it. And uh, I think this is the, the last solution I'm, I'm going to present. Is about finishing diet for for better carcass and quality. So here, here um, is uh, is from Italy. So in Italy, uh, there are, uh, there are even between countries, but also in uh, in Italy there are some differences in in the center and south of Italy. They prefer carcass that is more with with higher levels of fatness. So uh, the problem is that in in Italy. Uh, usually the fattening uh, farmers have many breeds and they are uh, late maturing uh, breeds. So uh, to increase the, the, fatten, the, the fat, uh, here a farmer proposed a strategy uh, that this increase the energy content uh, that can, uh, had to be different according the breed and if it's male or female. Uh, and of course, it needs the, the advice of a, a nutritional expert uh, and um, so, uh, and what he's saying is that uh, in breeds that have difficulty to deposit fat, uh, it is, is, uh, is necessary, maybe, if you have a market that re requires that to, to implement this type of, of solution. Implies more work because maybe you need to, you need to, to prepare different diets uh, and it's expensive because the fish, uh, the fish stuff are expensive but uh, it's worthy if the market uh, requires that. Okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you for, for listening now, but I also to, uh, would like to thank also all the network managers for the work they did and not only them, the farmers that provide solutions and, and also a special thank, uh, thanks to the, the technical working group from the production efficiency and meat quality that it was, uh, well, was very, uh, very useful uh, and, and very useful uh, work in, uh, in this group. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Virginia. So that was an excellent run through, I think, of an awful lot of solutions. Um, and what we might do just at this point is just bring in some of the network managers in particular that would have spoke, uh, would have presented some of these topics and innovations. So Virginia, we'll give you a bit of a rest now for the next few minutes. Thank you very much. You've done an excellent job. Thank you. Okay. 
So um, just in terms of one of the solutions that Virginia presented there was meat ultrasound, um, meat ultrasound analysis. So is using a, a meat ultrasound a test. And we have a particular network manager in the audience, uh, Jose Pass from Portugal. And Jose, I might just ask you one or two questions around that just to get your feedback on that. So the first question I suppose is, is it very easy for farmers themselves to implement? Uh, is it something you see farmers themselves implementing themselves on a farm or do they need a technician to do this for them? About the ultrasound uh, collecting data in vivo. In yes. vivo, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yes, of course, there is a, a, the need for a, a technical uh, experience person to do it. And um, this type of collecting data in vivo for meat quality has two ways to look, uh, to look at. Uh, because it can't be used the data for two purposes. One is the per, uh, when we have a, a performance testing center, and you and we we want to pr to produce um, and you, you rear young bulls to become future breeders. Uh, it's important to have this data uh, and uh, use it in the breed plan of the breed, because if you have a client with that looks for for instance. Um, for meat with less, uh, we, sorry, with a greater uh, um, level of marbling, of course, the animals are not all, all of them uh, equal. So you need to identify which young bulls are better for marbling and understand which one which is interesting to use in a breed plan to satisfy your production in terms to have the product that your client are looking for. And the other way to look at this uh, uh, methodology, in, in, it is important, is when you have a farm that rears and finish bulls to, to slaughter, to, to meat, to have beef, um, it's really important to understand the level of uh, subcutaneous uh, fat in the animal because it's really much more expensive to produce one unit of fat than one unit unit of muscle. So at a certain point, you have the annually at the, opti op the optimum in the economical uh, looking uh, situation, you have the animal, the animal at the, um, the optimal point to be culled, to go to the slaughterhouse. And you stay with the, with the animal in the farm a longer period of time, you are decreasing your income because you are producing fat, more fat than we need, and your margins will go low, lower. So these are the two points and two um, look, ways to look for and use this data in, in the practical way. But of course, there's a need for a, a, special, uh, a technique specialized in the in this situation so in terms of the actual measurement of this uh, do you do you feel it's something that should be done by a technician themselves and, and they could visit various different farms or should a farmer themselves buy this equipment well the the, the equipment is expensive okay and uh, the farmer to be able to do it uh, it will need to practice you understand how it has to be do it but it's not difficult to do it in the learn how to do it but um I think it will be easier to, I don't know, the breeders societies or the associations have one or two or how many uh, will be needed to do this work for the, this work for the farmers. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Thanks very much, Jose, for that. It was a great round, round up on the uh, ultrasound analysis. Um, we have also, there was a, an innovation that Virginia would have presented on meat plus sires. And we have a network manager in the audience from, uh, from Belgium that would have spoke a little bit about that. And Dirk, if you don't mind just speaking a bit about why was it brought about? What was the reason for inventing this kind of genetic test? And why would farmers themselves take this up? What's the importance for farmers to take this up? Yeah, I think uh, um, in the bovine project, uh, we see a lot of similarities uh, between the countries. But in Belgium, we have also uh, another type of producing uh, of meat, meat because uh, I think 55, 85% uh, uh, of our population of uh, is Belgian blue, and Belgian blue it's a it's a type of beef that we are have uh, produced uh, like the 
the people of Belgium, the consumers, wanted. We, we can produce lean uh, meat, but also uh, tender meat. Eh? So marbling is not so important, but in the search of that, uh, we see that uh, the Belgian blue uh, breed was a breed where there sometimes were uh, a little bit problems with genetic uh, um, DNA analysis, and we have uh, two universities, the University of Ghent and the University of Liège, uh, who has um, a lot of um, experience about searching defects in the Belgian blue, and we have what I said now what, uh, about meat plus, it's the tent, the, the defect we have found yet. Eh? So we have already nine other defects, and so we are selecting in the breed this, and now we have found a, a tent uh, defect, it's meat plus. So uh, we saw that certain parts of the carcass was, has less tender. It was only seen in a few uh, carcasses and only in a few muscles of the carcasses where the where the meat was less tender. Eh? So uh, and that's why they found it uh, and by experiments and now uh, it's very important for the future of the race eh? uh, of the breed um, of Belgian blue that the uh, university has found this and I think all the centers of artificial insemination uh, only uh, offer uh, meat plus sires, so I think uh, it's a very, very important for our breed uh, that all that information is coming to uh, to the farmers. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. So you can see how. Thanks very much, uh, Dirk. You can see how breed societies need to interact with farmers and researchers and so on. So it's important this multi-actor approach as we have done in this project that this knowledge is shared between different actors to try and get this to farm level and to improve the industry as a whole. So uh, we just move on from that topic of production efficiency and we move on to our next topic, which is on environmental sustainability. And our next speaker is Riet Azmet from uh, Ilvo in Belgium. And she's going to speak about tackling environmental sustainability on beef farms. Thank you, Richard. Um... So as Richard just introduced, um, I'm working at uh, ILVO in Belgium, and I'm the work package leader of the um, topic on environmental sustainability. So within this uh, topic, we also cover a lot of uh, priority topics, but for now I will just take you on um, um, a story on how uh, the carbon footprint of the farm can be uh, reduced. So first of all, the goal in the beef sector um, should be to strive for a zero emission beef, or at least to have beef that has a low impact um, on climate. Um, and many uh, different measures can be taken to decrease the carbon footprint of the farm. But of course, it's important to first know what is the situation now on uh, your farm. So for this, a lot of uh, tools exist to measure the carbon footprint. And we also uh, collected within the project uh, many tools that are available. This is just a, a, a small selection. Of course, there are many more tools. Um, and we also saw that the uh, most accurate tools are the ones that are uh, developed uh, nationally, because of course you have uh, the different laws between the different countries um, and also the, the different regions uh, and farming systems also depend and uh, are not the same in every country. Um, so if you want to know the carbon footprint of your tool, it's always interesting to see if there is a tool available in your country. If it's not, there are some tools um, that also, um, like the Cool Farm tool, for example, um, this is applicable for every country. So then once you know the carbon footprint of your uh, farm, um, there are different ways to um, decrease uh, your carbon footprint. And here I will just go over um, four different ways. Of course, within a tool, there are uh, much more um, topics described, but here uh, within uh, the project, um, we selected um, four different um, manners to decrease your carbon footprint. So first, um, it's to reduce the enteric emissions of uh, beef. Um, there are different ways to reduce your um, enteric emissions. Um, the main top uh, ways are to do it by feed management or by farm management. So within feed management, um, <clears throat> you can... Um, decrease the enteric emissions by different feed ingredients. Um, for example, linseed is known to decrease methane emissions, and that is because linseed is high in fat. 
Um, on the hip, there is a whole working mechanism of uh, why fats are reducing uh, the enteric emissions. Um, and for every uh, solution, I also uh, added a reduction potential. This reduction potential, this is not um, a true value because um, you also have um, within the different um, farms, you have different breeds, different um, feed uh, compositions. Um, so this is just to uh, be able to compare the different um, measures um, with each other. Um, but it's possible that in one farm, the reduction will be 8% and in the other one would be 12%. 12 but just to show you uh, the potential of the different um, ingredients. Um, then there is also um, rapeseed meal. And then especially in the combination with brewer's grain, um, if you have this combination and you re replace the soybean meal in the ration, then uh, there is a reduction potential of around 8% um, from the enteric emissions. Then another one is uh, the use of seaweed and then especially red seaweed. Red seaweed is high in a uh, bromoform and uh, this uh, substance is uh, able to decrease methane emissions. Um, Studies have shown that uh, it has a potential of 40%. Other studies have shown it's a, it has a much higher potential. Um, however, this, um, this um, active component that is decreasing the methane is also a toxic component. Um, and the studies done were mainly in the United States and Australia. Um, so the type of seaweed is an invasive so, uh, species for Europe. So scaling it up in uh, Europe um, will be a, a, diff a difficult task. So in research, still a lot of question marks are around seaweed, but it shows a great potential. Um, other ways within feed management is uh, looking at more uh, additives. Um, the first one is the use of tannins. Tannins are a substance that are, for example, in wine, but also different herbs like thyme um, are high in uh, tannins. Um, and they also show a potential to decrease methane. But there are a lot of sources of tannins. Um, so it's very difficult to put a reduction potential uh, on the use of tannins. And also research has shown um, for some a great potential um, in vitro studies. But then when they tried it in vivo studies, then uh, this potential was uh, lost. So this is still also a difficult ingredient uh, to see what the real potential is in the reduction of the methane emissions. Then we have a uh, nitrate. Nitrate is approved in uh, beef um, and it also showed a um, reduction of around 8%. And um, so you can see that many of the ingredients that you can use have a little bit the same um, um, reduction potential. Um, so nitrate is an interesting additive and especially it's uh, approved to use in uh, beef. And then the last one that I want to show you is Bovair. That's the commercial name for, for the Trinop. Um, most of you will probably know this is an additive that it's only approved um, in dairy cattle for now. And this is because there is not a lot of research available in beef. So normally um, it will also, they are continuing with research, so it should be also approved uh, in beef, but for now it's only for a dairy, but you can see it has a really nice reduction potential, so it will be nice uh, if we can also use this um, in beef. Then a second way to reduce your uh, enteric emissions is by uh, changing the farm management. These are uh, measures um, that will reduce your uh, emissions more on the long run. So if you change things, uh, it's not that you will see in the coming weeks that there will be a reduction uh, of the methane. So first you can do a genetic selection. Um, you have to try to find the phenotypes that are um, um, <clears throat> increasing the enteric emission and then you can just uh, do a selection. For example, the animals that have a low um, daily um, methane emission, for example, or you breed with the ones that have low methane emission per dry matter intake. The second one is a young stock rearing. Um, if you have a more efficiently young stock rearing so that you can reduce the age at first calving, you will also reduce the non-productive um, period of the calf. So the, the emissions um, during the non-productive period. And the last one is production systems. Uh, we also see that in an intensive system, there is a um, a lower um, enteric emission. And this is because uh, these diets are based on uh, concentrates and an extensive system is based on uh, grass. So these here, the emissions will be higher. We had um, 
some kind of discussion uh, during our <laughs> previous meeting in um, Pamplona. Um, if you want to know the carbon footprint of your farm and you uh, are looking at an extensive system farm, and of course it's not the goal to make the farm intensive to have a very low uh, carbon footprint, uh, because if you, look, if you look at a complete carbon footprint, you also have um, water is included, carbon sequestration is included, biodiversity, and these things will score better in an extensive system. But if you look only at enteric emissions, the intensive system will score better than an extensive system. Then a second way to reduce the carbon footprint on farm is to improve the carbon sequestration. So there are a lot of uh, good practices already implemented. For example, hedgerow, silver pasture. In this way, you will put more um, trees on your farm. You can do it in rows, so more the hedgerow, but you can also scatter them more um, in your field. And trees are known to um, have a good um, um, possibility to capture carbon. Um, so in this way, you will improve the carbon sequestration of your farm. Another way is to use additives. Um, different additives can improve the soil health and in healthy soil uh, will be able to capture more carbon. Um, on the hub, there are uh, um, good practices uh, from the use of biochar. Biochar is a type of uh, charcoal. Um, this, this will improve um, the soil fertility, but also uh, organic waste can improve the humus in the soil. So all these uh, things um, will, have, um, will be benefiting the soil and improve carbon sequestration. And then another way is to um, change the management. Um, if you have a more holistic approach, um, then um, it will also be more beneficial for carbon sequestration. Also permanent grassland, because grass is also known to um, capture a lot of carbon. It has the same potential as a forest. But then, of course, your grassland needs to stay grass. Um, and in Estonia, there was also um, a good practice on bale grazing that also improved uh, carbon sequestration. Then a third way to um, improve your uh, carbon footprint is to improve the biodiversity of your farm. As we know, there are a lot of small measures that a farmer can do, uh, like putting bee hotels or flower zones um, or nest boxes. But here I will go um, more into detail into one innovation, um, and that's the use of biostimulants. A biostimulant is a natural product and it improves the growth and the strength of the plants. So actually the nutrient uptake will be improved um, and it will make the plant more resilient to, for example, drought. But in Belgium, there was a collaboration between the STEM Agro and University of Ghent, and they were using chicken feathers. They saw that chicken feathers are high in uh, protein. Um, and when they started to do trials with them, so they added these as a fertilizer, um, the plants were growing uh, much better. Um, they also found uh, that you can decrease your conventional fertilizer until 70%. And if you add chicken feathers with it, um, you had the same growing potential of the plants. And this means that you also have less nitrogen leached and also lower uh, carbon dioxide. This is a project that is still ongoing. So now they are looking if it's possible to also commercialize this. Um, and an extra interesting point in this is uh, the use of chicken feathers um, is of course also more circular uh, economy because it's a byproduct of the poultry industry. Then a fourth way to reduce the, um, to improve the carbon footprint is to reduce the nutrient leaching. Um, here I will also go deeper into one specific example, the use of green cover crops in maize. So in Belgium, we have the problem um, that the harvest of maize is quite late. So if you sow your uh, green cover crop after the harvest of the maize, um, there is not enough um, time to develop well. And um, having a green cover crop has many uh, good advantages. Um, <clears throat> it improves soil health. It will also uh, capture um, nutrients. So there will be less nutrient leaching. It helps against erosion uh, and many other advantages. So within this demonstration, um, they were looking at um, if it's possible to sow uh, your um, cover crop simultaneously with sowing your uh, maize. Um, or if it's in a later stadium, also uh, interesting to, um, to sow it. 
Um, in the picture here, you can see, of course, if you have, um, if you sow it together with your maize, you can uh, choose the more slowly developing grasses. Um, but if you want to um, sow it only in a later stage, then of course you need to uh, choose um, a grass that is more quickly uh, developing. So there are different uh, pros and cons. Um, the positive things that they found after uh, implementing this demonstration is when they sowed um, the green cover crop um, in the fourth to fifth leaf stadium, um, the maize production was improved. Um, this, if you compare it with uh, growing your green cover crop after the harvest of your maize. And also um, the nitrate uh, residue in the soil was much lower than if you compare it with um, the sowing after the harvest of the maize. Of course, there are also some negative things if you um, sow it together with your maize. And that is that um, you can only use grassy types of green cover crops. <clears throat> so if you want to have a more uh, qualitative green cover crop because you want to use it as a feed, then you have to wait un until after uh, the harvest. And also um, when your um, grass is uh, growing in between your uh, maize, after harvest of the maize, you cannot work under um, the residues. Um, if you cannot work under the residues, the grass will be high in ash content. And again, then it's not interesting to use your grass um, as a uh, feed. So these are all things that a farmer should take into account. If you really want to use it as a feed, then it's not interesting to sow it already together with um, the maize. But if it's um, just to use it as a cover crop, um, then it's uh, interesting um, to do it. And um, But there is a whole document um, with, because they did more than uh, this um, um, trial. Um, on the hub, you can find a document where they explain um, everything that was done within this demonstration. So here you can see a picture um, where they saw it um, a little bit um, later than the, the maze, uh, just how it looks um, in practice. So once you know um, your carbon footprint and you also know how to decrease it, of course, it's interesting for a farmer to know how can you be rewarded for the things that you are implementing. So first of all, we all know the common agricultural policy. Um, this is a funding at a European level um, and it's adapted uh, to national levels. Within uh, the bovine project, we collected uh, examples of different countries, um, how they implement it. So it's always nice to see the difference between the different countries. And this is uh, explained a little bit more um, on the hub. Another example that we have is the high environmental value. That's a French label. Um, but in this label, it's, um, the label is uh, divided in four categories. <clears throat> and for every category, you need to have a score uh, above 10. And if you have this score, um, you can have this certification. And with the certification, you can ask for a higher price of your meat. So this is really nice for the farmers uh, because you will get rewarded for uh, implementing several measures. Another um, way to be rewarded uh, that we were looking into is uh, the re rewards or investments via private investors. Here there is an example. Um, it's a Dutch example, uh, the Open Soil Index. Um, within this index, it's a little bit similar like the high environmental value. Um, by doing different measures on your farm, you get a score, and based on this score, you can get a reward. Um, different um, um, co private companies are uh, participating in this, um, a bank, but there are also other um, uh, companies, and they will all reward in a different way. For example, the, the bank can have a discount on the loan, for example, for the farmers. Um, as far as I know, this is not um, set yet. So the open soil index is there. You can have your, um, um, you can know what your um, score is on your farm, but I don't think there are already rewards uh, linked to this. Um, it's also ongoing. Um, and the last one is um, <clears throat> when local government is also helping in a reward system. This is very interesting because um, they can really adapt the reward to um, a certain region. 
Um, I, I especially think about the bigger countries um, where you have different regions. If you have just one solution, it can be that it's not very applicable to all uh, regions. And here we um, explained um, an example that was done in uh, Belgium, where the local government wanted to compensate for a car park that they were building. Um, and they were giving free uh, land to the farmers and they could use it, but they have to implement uh, carbon measures. This was in a project. Um, so the farmers also need to um, write down all the costs that were coming with these measurements, because after the project, they want to um, um, they want to have a nice reward with it because they cannot give uh, free land forever. Um, and then also all farmers in the area can participate in this. Um, so then they can have um, an uh, adapted reward um, for everyone who is participating in the area. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ria. So that was a great uh, roundup of some of the solutions that we found. So we have a few questions, Ria, just three or four for you. <coughs> Here we just pitched to you. Um, and the first question was in relation to uh, the effects of, um, sorry, just one second here. So uh, the effects of all of the, of all of the innovation or uh, all of the solutions you found for reducing enteric emissions mm -hmm. are they cumulative if you add them all together or <laughs> did it have kind of contrasting effects? No, I don't think it will be, uh, and I think it will also be difficult, especially with the feed ingredients, to put them all in a <laughs> one ration. Yes. Uh, so, uh, no. So has there been any study as such to look at maybe the impacts of, of a number of these innovations in tandem? Um, that I know of, no, but I think Karen is saying that there is um, coming, or the studies ongoing that uh, looking at uh, synergies or maybe no synergies okay. between different measures. Okay, very important going forward, you're saying. Uh, so another question we have there is in terms of the train up. Um, so there has been uh, some results to show that it can be between 10 and 20%. And does this depend on the nitrates level in the diet uh, in addition to the train up? I, I don't know, yeah. but do you know? So I, I might just pass to Karen <laughs> Goosens here, who's also the lead on this working group. Thank you. The effect of uh, TRINOP is depending on uh, different uh, aspects. Uh, first, how it is implemented in the diet. You can implement it in the roughage or you can include it in a concentrate. And depending on the way you feed it, uh, there's a difference in reduction because it has to be provided during the day. If you give it in a one dose, for example, once a day or even once a week, it will not be as effective as if you implement it or include it in the roughage and the cow can eat it during the day, all day. So that's uh, one thing uh, that can affect. And also the inclusion in the type of diet has an effect on, on how effective it is in practice. And that's uh, a lot of research is still going on to evaluate the effect of the diet uh, on the train up. Thank you, Karen. Okay, so we've one more question here as well. Um, so the name of the project you said with chicken feathers as fertilizer, have you a name for that project, Reed? Um, no, but you can contact me and I can give more information, yes. but I, I don't know. Uh, by heart uh, the name of the project. And is this available on the Bovine Knowledge Hub, this innovation? Um, can... This one specifically, I think um, there is a, um, a solution on biostimulants and there are several um, examples and it's okay. one of the examples so you can find it on the hub. Um, Perfect. But I think in Dutch there will be more information um, on the internet on the project that is uh, going. But you can find links within the Bovine yeah. Knowledge Hub to this project. Yeah. And, and just a further question on that, is there any publications that stem from this project that you know of? That I know of, I know, okay. um, but I can check it. Uh, and then maybe I can also add it on the hub if I uh, okay. find more um, publications on this. So you'll find, yeah, that's perfect. Thanks very much, Ria. Um, just one last one, I think here. Um, as the byproduct of insect bioconversion, uh, the frass or fertilizer soil improver when breed on agri waste being considered in the contents, context of environmental sustainability. So I'm not sure. Um, and we actually have the person who asked that question if you just wanted to voice that yourself, maybe just for clarity. 
Thank you very much. This is a personal interest of mine because we've been involved in this topic for some time. And the Netherlands is a great innovator in this field about the utilization of insects, um, both in creation of protein, but also in the use of what is left over when the insects are bred on agri waste, for example. And there's a lot of new material coming out that shows uh, that the frass, as it's called, uh, is, a, is a very good alternative fertilizer and soil improver. There's a lot of work going on, particularly in tomato and, and potato. Mm. And I just wondered whether it's something within the Netherlands, perhaps, and other European countries that are developing this research, uh, whether it's something that's in the equation that's being talked about. As far as I know, I, I never heard of it, ah. <laughs> but it's ah. interesting. I'm glad I raised it. Then. Yes. <laughs> That's one of the benefits of having so many actors involved mm -hmm. in this project and we've, we can share knowledge even at this late stage in the project with each other. Um, so we have another question here and, and firstly it was a comment just to say a very interesting presentation uh, from you, Reid. And then regarding the use of chicken fe feathers, the plants being considered in the trials were trees, is that right? Um, no. Um, but I don't remember which plants uh, were used, but it was not in trees because it was in small, um, it was on lab scale um, that they were doing it. So, but I'm thinking if it was uh, in uh, strawberries or something, um, but um, I don't know, you don't say, no. yeah, I'm not sure which uh, okay. plants it was okay. tested on. That's great, thanks Reid. And uh, just a question from Spain here. So it's uh, the use of additives is effectively giving low results in enteric fermentation but also decreases the production of VFA and therefore decreases the production. So that's more of a comment, uh, really. Um, I'm not sure if you've anything to add to that, but uh, regarding the best practices, in some cases, they may employ an extra financial burden on the farmer. And I suppose that's a very, very important thing to take into account is the, the economic uh, viability mm -hmm. of a lot of these being implemented on beef farms. Yeah. So is there any in particular that you could pick out or did you think might be easily implemented in terms of economics? Um, I think many of the additives will be a cost for the farmer um, because in many case, case, uh, cases it will not um, have an effect on uh, production. So then it's always interesting to see if there is another way um, that you can have a reward by implementing uh, several measures um, or something. Um, but I know some farmers are implementing it just because they want to be uh, have a better story around their beef. Um, and in some cases, you also see that they will sell um, their meat to uh, local producers, for example, or slaughter, um, slaughterhouses locally, because then they can ask also a higher price uh, because they have a story to tell. Okay, so that kind of ties in with some of our previous research innovations from our first thematic area, where you look at quality labels really to label to get a higher premium for the products mm -hmm. you're producing on farms. Yeah. So they're all interrelated, as we can see in terms of these um, topics themselves don't stand alone. Um, so just we're, we're moving on a little in time um, and, and I think that's all we have really for you in terms of questions. Okay. So thank you very much for it. That was no uh, an excellent presentation. So we have a question here and will we share the recording? And the simple answer is yes, the recording will be shared after the meeting. And also along with the recording, there'll be a list of all the innovations and good practices that were shared with you in this meeting and the linkages to those in the Bovine Knowledge Hub. So our next speaker is actually going to speak about the Bovine Knowledge Hub, and that's Rhonda Smith from Minerva Communications in the UK. And she's also going to speak about a number of the products we've produced in, in, in the project so far, uh, such as the magazine and so on, and all the partners have been heavily involved in. So I'll hand over to you, Rhonda. Thank you very much, Richard. And I think um, perhaps all of us just need to take a moment, whether you're listening online or in the room, to say thank you very much indeed, not only to our speakers today, but obviously to the very large number of people who've taken part in network meetings over the last three years to actually get us to this point. I think you'll all agree there's a, a wealth of information uh, that's um, been provided just top, top line today, obviously, because there's not enough time. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how you can continue to access all the material uh, that has been uh, generated and continuing to do so. Um, so the most. Uh, so, as you've heard many times before, uh, the Bovine Project has created a knowledge hub, the BKH as we call it, and there is the, uh, the link to it. I am expecting that a very large percentage of people 
visiting with us online today already know about the hub, but let me just re-emphasize that this is where you can find all the information and all the inf and the, the links that have been uh, provided today. I think as was mentioned earlier, we will, to everybody who's registered, not only those who have actually been able to join us today, but to everyone who's registered to join the meeting, will receive uh, an email uh, via our usual e-news uh, um, method with all the links showing you specifically where you can access the information that's been highlighted in the presentations, which we hope uh, will be of use. And I think has already been mentioned, obviously, the recording of the meeting as well. A few important points to remember about the hub. Um, at the minute, there's over 400 posts on there. Um, and that obviously includes the 340 specific ones uh, that have been highlighted. And the 96 over the last uh, two and a half years that have been submitted to the EIP Agri portal as well. So that's one element of how the project is ensuring that the legacy, the knowledge, the shared collective learning that's gone on over the last three years is going to remain accessible, as well as, of course, the hub remaining open for a considerable period of time after the end of the funded period. Now, the, the hub is free access to everybody. Everybody can look at it. But if you want to submit content or submit a comment, you must register. It's a very light registration. We haven't asked for, for much information, um, but it, that's important for us. And there is light also moderation vetting of any content so that we can be sure that anything else that's being uploaded to the hub is appropriate. But please do remember that everybody online and obviously all of our project members, uh, please ensure that everybody in your own teams back where you come from also are clear about that because we want this to continue uh, generating particularly obviously practical knowledge about how implementation is going of the research innovations, the practice, the, uh, the good practices and indeed the demonstrations. Um, the search facility now works extremely well because we have so much content. So if you're looking at the Knowledge Hub, the most important thing to do is to look first at the search facility uh, with keywords. Obviously, you can put your own keywords in, but obviously the, um, the project itself has generated a quite large number of keywords. And if these are put in uh, appropriately, then a lot of knowledge will be, uh, will be um, flagged up for you. Um, the, as you've heard already, uh, the project is organized around four key themes. So obviously the Knowledge Hub is also around, uh, arranged around those key themes. And if you go onto the homepage, you'll see that's the first thing you encounter. If you're new to the Hub, you can simply click on the theme to begin with to get you into the whole uh, gamut of information on that particular theme, whether it's animal health, whether it's socioeconomic, et cetera. Um, there is some multi-language material available on the hub. Various partners have uploaded uh, materials in their own language. But it is important to remember that if you use your browser, you can actually translate uh, the material that's available on the hub already. A lot of people still um, aren't sure about that, but do try it. Uh, Google isn't perfect, but most of the time it's good enough, um, which of course you can then, uh, if you want to download it, if you're registered, you can then obviously utilize that copy in your own language. Um, you can also click directly on the hub on the priority topics. You've heard a lot from our speakers this morning about the priority topics. So as an alternative, if you particularly want to find out what's been uploaded around lameness, for example, then simply click on that priority topic. And just a point at the moment uh, to let you know about the data, the analytics of the hub. We have nearly 4,000 users, active users of the hub to date, which is very impressive. But actually from our perspective, as leader of the uh, communications dissemination, I, I'm really very pleased about this, is that the average number of pages viewed uh, across all those users is at the moment 6.3 pages on the website, which means that people are really taking their time to look at the content. And the average time on the site is five minutes, 42 seconds, which again is really quite dramatic. 
most websites, if you get people to stay on for 20 seconds, you're lucky uh, to look at one page that they come in on. So I think this is a big indicator that bovine has hit the right spot, you know, in terms of beef cattle farming across Europe. So we need to continue, continue with that. Um, so these are just examples of a few posts, again, for those who might not be familiar. They all look rather different, dependent on the topic. Some are more text heavy, some are, have more audiovisual material. But the idea is that obviously all of these posts are ready for implementation and use, whether you're sitting in an office because you're involved in policy, or whether you are actually on farm, or if you are an advisor, all they're ready for you to use. Now, the hub, uh, which is in itself a website, is supplemented by our main project website. So please don't ignore this as a really good source of information and a resource. Um, there's, the, um, there's the website up there. I think it's in, in everybody's um, on the slides and everywhere. So you, you can't ignore it. You really can't. Um, and we, one of the things from our perspective worked on the communications is we're really grateful and, and really extremely pleased to know that we have such good illustrative material for this sector. And thank you again to everybody who's submitted photographs uh, for our use uh, across the website and for other purposes. So on the website, obviously, you will find the normal things, our news feed, our social, feed, uh, social media links, but also importantly, the information about our network managers. Um, and you'll see that on the website, uh, we have profiled all the network managers and their con contact details because um, it's important, I think, on a country by country basis that the activity around networking continues and all the network managers and indeed anyone else in the project will be delighted to hear directly from you by email. Uh, so uh, again, on the website, just to reinforce um, when you go into the home page, you'll see all these country flags. And you can access through those flag, flags um, specific country pages where uh, information materials are in the language of that country. So automatically there for you. Um, also on the home page, you can link straight through to the 12 webinars that we've uh, created. Again, with thanks to all partners who've been involved in those. And you've heard, I think, mention of two or three of those already. Um, so we have a suite of 12 webinars, but there's many other, uh, there's many other um, materials up there as well, hosted via YouTube, um, including animations and many other videos. Um, the other thing on the homepage to note is that there's the, um, not only the themes, as I've said before, replicated from the hub, but also the uh, associated and linked projects with which Bovine has been involved, direct links there to those projects, and indeed to our advisory board, um, which um, has been very active throughout the, uh, the life of the project. Now, the, the, as we know, um, with, with end users, i.e. farmers, people working out in the field uh, and in your own regions and countries, language is a very important aspect. So with a very modest budget, we've been able to do a number of things, again, in partnership with all partners uh, to actually create uh, some significant pieces of material, not only that that you can access through the website and the country pages, but directly here as well. So if you go into the nine country dedicated country pages, you'll find the recently published uh, magazine supplements in each of those languages. Um, here's an example here, this is the Belgian one, but you can also find the reports on the latest national meetings that have been held. Um, all the countries, all the network managers uh, held one of these meetings every year to develop their own, own uh, locally based uh, networks as well. And the third thing you can find is obviously again, but information about the network managers, but in their own language and more material about their, their specialisms and what they've been involved with. So again, just to reinforce that these are accessed via the flags on the homepage. So just, uh, this is just a flavor. We're very pleased with these, very proud of these. And thanks again to all our partners who've contributed to this and we know that these magazines, one in each of the nine languages are going to be utilized going forward in 2023 
um, and will prove a very big asset. Uh, many end users, people on farms and in different situations, people still like things on paper. We know we're trying to reduce our impact regarding this, but it's when people are out, you know, working directly, uh, having things in paper in your own language is really important. Uh, we've also created a, a template for these bite-sized cards, which seem to have gone down very well, uh, which really summarize highlighted topics that each of the countries have chosen. And these are all on the, on the website too, uh, both in English and also in the local, the local languages. And we hope this template actually might be utilized by partners going forward. Uh, you know, small A5 cards that can be easily produced, economically produced, at, um, at, at significant numbers in order to distribute at uh, internal meetings, but also external fairs and so on. So the important point I think to close is to say, you know, Bovine will be staying in touch with you, uh, people online, people who are on our database, uh, people who are um, working with the different networks. We will be producing um, our final e-news through the funded period. Uh, obviously, through the two, through the hub and through the website, you will have uh, connections available, direct emails and so on. And please do follow, comment on, comment on our social media channels. They're all very active. Um, but again, with all, we can do more. I mean, social media for us is, a, is an added, added benefit, um, but it can be for many um, particular groups can be very, very effective. So I think on that point, that's, um, that's it. So hub, website, uh, materials, please continue to engage with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rhonda. And I, um, I think that just ends, ends there our morning very well. There's just one final question for Virginia that somebody put in. And I'm not, I put it into Google Translate, but I'm not sure if it translated well. And it just said in Virginia's presentation, she said there was an optimal quant quality and optimal, optimal weight for the first collection. I presume that means is a conception or carving possibly um, and just should be great but if you could better clarify the optimal values for the first collection and what is the drawback of early and late collection. I'm not sure, you're not sure what that means. Yeah, the, the word in Spanish is complicado. See, is it, is it conception possibly? Is it? <laughs> yeah, maybe it's easier for you to read yeah. it in Spanish. Yeah. Than, <laughs> so this Sorry. is the question here. Ah, this is in Portuguese. Oh, Portuguese. Oh, that's why you didn't translate well. Then okay, wrong one. Maybe. Okay, okay. That's why I didn't translate then. Okay. First meeting. Okay, that's yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. There's a lesson I can mention the very first meeting. She would appreciate if she could clarify better the argument of the first meeting and in case of the first early and late. Ah, okay, so uh, this question is like um, is uh, about um, reproduction. So maybe here also we have a uh, richer or richer is gone. <laughs> uh, so uh, the question is about the the first mating. The, when is uh, the most appropriate uh, moment? So uh, I had to say that I am not expert in in this. I'm I'm working more about um, mid quality, uh, but in the in the presentation, what uh, what I shown it's is uh, is that is uh, more or less about uh, sixty percent of the of the weight of the of the animal. So it depends on on the breed. Uh, so I don't know if maybe someone here uh, more expert can can add something something else. <laughs> well, basically, is what Virginia said. Uh, it has to be at the time when the, the young female has at least 60% uh, of the adult weight. But it's, there's another issue that is really important. Uh, you, you can't put the, the, the heifer for the first, uh, at, at the first mating too early because, and be careful with the second mating. Because if you do that, you will be, we will have a long period until between the first calving and the second calving. So it depends on the breed, it depends on the system, on the production system. And you just, you just have to find what is the optimal 
age to do it with your heart. Simple as that. Thank you very much, Jose Pass. And I think yeah, it does indicate the need for, you know, it recognizes the knowledge that farmers have about their own farms and their own production systems and the need to bring that into play. And um, so it, it gives me great pleasure, well, also, I suppose, the sadness to, to, to close this meeting. And I just want to thank our presenters from this morning Maite uh, Gilar from Spain, Richard Lynch from Chagask in Ireland, Keith de Roost from CRPA in Italy, Alexander Reich from FLI in Germany. Uh, Virginia Rasconi from the University of Zaragoza in Spain, uh, Riet uh, Desmet from uh, Ilvo in Belgium, and Rhonda Smith from Minerva UK. Um, but obviously, as I mentioned at the start, you know, there were 18 partners involved in this, so there were just a number of speakers selected for to present this morning, but very, the work presented very much reflects the hard work of all of the partners um, over the three years. So I want to thank all of the partners for their contribution to this event. And as Rhonda indicated as well, you know, we did have a lot of engagement with, <laughs> we do a clap at the end, thanks Rhonda. There was a, we did have a lot of engagement with many people throughout the course of the three years. Uh, people contributed in terms of identifying their needs or contributed good practices or just attended and participated in our events. So I think that that was, was all very useful. And I think it's, it's great to see that, that the networks that have been formed. Um, and I suppose, you know, the, some of the solutions that we identified can be very easily transferred from one context to another, and some are more difficult to transfer. But I think the important point is that we, we did all share knowledge, and even if a solution is not directly relevant to you, it does help to, to think about, you know, why are you doing what you are doing, and why, why is that not relevant to you? And I think we can see that farmers, you know, did even if they didn't say, oh, yes, that's perfect for me, it did get them to reflect on why they're doing what they're doing. And I think that reflective exercise is, is useful for all of us. Um, so I want to just thank the, the attendees. Um, there was more than 500 people registered, and we're very pleased with that. And as we said, the recording will be made available through the website after the event, and it will be circulated to all the people who registered. Um, so there will be more people um, involved in that as well. Um, so the, the links to the solutions will also be shared with you along with the, with the recording. Um, so just to encourage you to continue to engage with Bovine, um, that the project, the funded period of the project will end in December, but at the end of this month, but that the website will stay live and the knowledge will continue to be there and all of the people who've been involved in Bovine will continue to engage with the industry and hopefully to bring us, continue us all on, on that, that road to enhance sustainability. So we can do the clap and we can close then. Thank you very much, everybody.